If you have your Bibles, get them with you, get them in hands. And uh, if you have the ability, would you stand to your feet and let's honor the Lord. I'm going to go down on my knees and let's pray together. Father, we come to you tonight in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we're so grateful that we can come into the house of God, Lord, a place where we can have a God encounter, Lord, not just come in and sing some songs and hear some funny illustrations and stories or a Reader's Digest suggestion, but God, we can hear your heartbeat, God. We can hear your word. We can catch your vision for our lives, Lord, and that we can grow up into what you want us to be and do all that you have called us to do. Tonight, Lord, we acknowledge that it's not a man or a woman, not the young or the old, not the black, the white, the brown, any other color we could imagine. God, we've come to hear from you. So be welcome in this place, Holy Spirit. Be our teacher, be our guide. Give us your vision, your wisdom, your instruction, your direction, even the correction we need for our lives, Lord, and we'll give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it. God, we thank you that tonight, God, that you speak to our hearts, open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our hearts to have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown, and may it produce fruit in each and every one of our individual lives. Tonight, Lord, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we'd ask it for all the churches, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. God, we would pray for our brothers and sisters tonight, God, that are meeting uh, in your name, God, that you would bless them as you would bless us, God, that you would give them increase as you would increase us, Lord, and that your spirit would be amongst them as you are amongst us tonight, Lord, and we thank you for that. God, also, we don't forget about our persecuted brothers and sisters scattered abroad throughout the world, Lord. We ask that you encourage them, lift them up, strengthen them, protect them, guide them, guard them, direct them, Lord. We ask, God, that they would endure to the end to the glory of God. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement, and we say... Amen. Today, as you're grabbing your seat, I thought I would give you a little throwback. How many of you guys remember Peanuts, right? The, the comic strip, Charles Schultz. I just love the wit and wisdom of this man. He was actually a godly man, and, and uh, oftentimes you'll find that um, he expressed things that were godly principles in his comic strips. And this one's maybe not too godly, but it is funny. And uh, I, I, I thought I'd read this kind of to open up, but you guys like Linus and Lucy? classic brother and sister, and there's a, a comic where Lucy comes walking in, Linus is sitting on the ground, I'll put it up on the overheads, I think we got that, and her first words to him is switch channels. Now Linus is just sitting there and just kind of ignores her, and she says, I said switch channels. I want to watch my program. Sounds like some of your siblings growing up, right? And he says, are you kidding? What makes you think that you can just walk right in here and take over? And then she clenches a fist. She says, these five fingers, individually, they're nothing. But when I curl them together like this into a single unit, they form a weapon that is terrible to behold. <laughs> Some of you guys, that was you when you were growing up, right? You were punking your little brother or sister. <laughs> and he says, which channel do you want? <laughs> he sighs, and then at the very end, he says, why can't you guys get organized like that, talking to his own hand? Tonight I want to talk to you about a principle that you'll find in your Bibles called greater unity. Greater unity. We need to get it together. Can you say amen to that? We need to get organized. We need to get ourselves on the same page. Because if we can do that, we can be more effective for the kingdom of God. You remember in the Bible, it talks about uh, the, in, in, in the Tower of Babel. They were all getting together, and they were building this tower, and they were ascending really high up into the heavens. And God confused their language. Why? Because he said, if they can't get it together, then they won't be able to accomplish anything. But if they agree, and if they can get it together, then they can do anything that their heart desires. And so it's a spiritual principle. The Bible also says in the book of Psalms, how good and pleasant it is when brethren to dwell together in unity, for there the Lord commands a blessing. Blessing is the power to succeed. So we know that if we can get together in unity, then we can have success in every area of our life. And whatever we put our mind to, if we can bring this principle and this power of unity in our lives, we can have greater blessings. Just recently, I, I was invited to a meeting. It was very privileged to go. Uh, it was a meeting of churches all across the Inland Empire and across the greater Los Angeles area. Some churches even came uh, from the San Diego area. And the Christian colleges were asking for help. There's some uh, legislation that they're concerned about. It's going to change either the way they do what they do with Christian college and schooling and all that kind of stuff, or uh, they're going to have to stop receiving government funding, which will hinder a lot of people from going to Christian colleges. Actually, will 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 hurt a lot of the people who wouldn't be able to go otherwise, underprivileged and, and some of the minorities, that sort of thing. So they were asking us for prayer. They were asking us if, if, if we had a heart to, to get involved, that we would write a letter to our, our 
our congressman, that sort of a thing. And, and you know, really the whole meeting really could have been an email. It really could have been something that they sent us a, a, just a letter and said, hey, we're, we're concerned about this. Would you guys help us out? Would you bring awareness? Would you uh, see if there's anybody out there that, that wants to get on board or wants to write a letter or maybe you want to rally and, and go up to Sacramento, that sort of a thing? They really could have done that, you know, long distance. But the neat thing that I was privileged to be a part of was that they opened up in prayer. Now, that doesn't sound like much, but in the room, there was several denominations. There was uh, different demographics. There was different cultures represented. In fact, uh, the, there was people that were wearing collars and big crosses, and then there was people in full three-piece suits, and then there was little old me just looking around like, how did I get invited to this meeting? You know what I'm saying? Like, who's this little white boy from Reno Valley hanging out with all these, these guys, you know, and, and kind of looking around the room? But it was just amazing to hear the prayers. They opened it up, and they said, anybody that wants to pray, we got a couple people that are going to kind of start us in prayer, but then we're going to allow you guys to pray and the prayers that came out of these men and women just touched me so deeply I mean they they literally got on me and got into me Uh, they were praying the word they were praying for one another they were repenting of bad attitudes they've had about other churches I mean there is competition amongst churches in case you didn't know that sometimes we look over the fence and we say wow the grass looks a little greener on the other side you know what I'm saying And, and and yet it shouldn't be in the body of Christ and the, the heartbeat that I heard in this meeting so affected me and so touched me and just so blessed me to see what was going on. Martin Luther King Jr. said this. He said, we've all come here in different ships, but we're all in the same boat now. I'll just let that marinate a little bit. We, we might have all come here on different ships. You know, our ancestors came here different ways and under different circumstances. But isn't that a unifying thing to think about, that we're all in the same boat now? We're in this together, and especially when it comes to church. Now, this message is going to center in on us here in this church because I got you in front of me. I don't have all the churches in front of me right now, but I do have you guys, and so I want to talk to us about what happens when we get together in unity. In other words, the church here has vision. This is a passionate church. This is a church that's doing something, as you can see by all the announcements. We're constantly having something going on. There's an outreach that's going on. Back to school bash. We're reaching the kids. We're going down into Mexico. We've got a men's event. We've got a women's conference. We've got all sorts of stuff that's going on all the time. The youth are up in the mountains. Then the children are up in the mountains. Things are happening all the time. And if we can come together, if we can unify in our vision and our purpose under the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and if we can get together, then what is there that we can't accomplish, church? I said, what is there that we can't accomplish? See, the answer to that is nothing. Why? Because anything we put our mind to, if we have the will of God, and we've got the power of the Spirit of God behind it, and we can unite rather than divide, then there's nothing that we can't accomplish for the kingdom of God. I'm glad I'm preaching this message because it sounds like it's new information to you. So what happens when we get together in unity? First thing is this, is that there's a greater effectiveness. Turn me to the book of Ecclesiastes. If you find the Psalms, go past the Psalms. To the Proverbs, right after the Proverbs, you will find the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter number four, some great wisdom from the word of God. And Ecclesiastes chapter four, verse number nine through verse number 12, talks about this principle that we can have greater effectiveness. Look at what it says. It says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. You ever been working on something alone and it took you forever? Okay, some of you guys, that was your day today, right, at work. You said, yeah, Pastor Dan, I just got off the job site, and that was me today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Terry, for that one hand raised. Praise the Lord. You're with me, brother. We're in unity right now. Thank you. But then someone comes along and says, hey, can I help you? And you say, oh, thank God. Yes, please. Come on in here. Help me lift this. Help me do this. Help me. Hey, can you go nail that while I go and do this? And I'm going to go over here and paint while you caulk or whatever it is, you know? And, and so it says they have a good reward for their labor. Verse 10, if... They fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Oftentimes you hear stories of people out there in the wilderness, the the survivor stories, one guy against the, the wilderness, that sort of a thing, right? But listen, if that guy falls down by himself, he's not getting back up. That's why they bring a camera crew with the lone survivor guy out there in the wilderness so that they can radio in GPS coordinates to the helicopter to come and airlift him out of there if anything happens. 
But see, it says if we have someone with us, then if we should fall, someone can catch us, someone can help us up. Verse number 11, again. So he's saying, uh, let, me, let me drive the point home for you now. If two lie down together, they will keep warm, but how can one be warm alone? Verse 12, though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Some of you guys grew up here in the IE, and you know what I'm talking about when it says if, if you go in the fight alone, you're getting whipped. But if you got your big brother behind you, or you got someone by your side, right? Hey, let's roll, bro, right? And, and all of a sudden, you can win the fight. See, if we go out there in the world alone, if it was just Pastor Dan doing the work of the ministry here at The Rock, if it was just one of you guys doing what you do here at The Rock, your volunteer service, then we wouldn't be very effective. In fact, we probably would give up and quit because there would be a time where something wasn't working, something wasn't happening, where, where the, the person that you were training as an SPT stopped coming and you got discouraged. If you didn't have another SPT to tell you, hey, that happened to me the first five people that I tried to train, but then on the sixth one, man, finally they stuck around and I got some victory hang in there you can do it if, if that didn't happen then you would give up and quit and yet we have a greater effectiveness when people get together when we come together you know the reason why we can do backpacks for thousands of kids in our community is because us we as the church get together we come in agreement we come and we put our resources in we put our time in we put our talents in and now all of a sudden it makes a lasting impact on our community and on eternity we is always greater than I, and us is better than me. Greater effectiveness. Second thing is this, greater growth. Do you know that when we unite, we can have greater growth? As a pastor, I am interested in growing this church. That's, that's the heart of every pastor. Is we want to see people in, in the chairs. We want to see people getting it. We want to see people growing, in not just numerically in filling up a church service, uh, even though that's, that's great and that's wonderful. And I believe that's the heartbeat of God because you'll find the, the marriage supper, right? The, 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 the master hated the empty seats. I know that God hates that there's empty seats. And so we got to fill that up and we can do that. We can be greater at, at reaching people if we get together, but also greater growth in the heart. What good is it to have large gatherings if we don't have large hearts? What good is it to have a filled church and an empty heart? What good is it to have masses of people but messes of people? Come on, somebody. See, that's why this church preaches and teaches the way that we do. That's why we open the Bible and not the internet pages when we get together. That's why we're constantly driving you back to what does the Lord say? What's God speaking to you? Have you prayed about it yet, brother? Have you listened to the voice of God, sister? That's why Breaking Free is so brilliant is because they took something that everybody thinks is so complex. You need 24 steps to freedom. No, you need to sit in church. You need to listen to the voice of God. You need to pray and then write it down and tell somebody about it and be accountable. That's really the whole program. It's just biblical principles. And yet, we miss it oftentimes. But we want to see greater growth. And when we unite, we can see that growth. Look at what Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16 in the New Living Translation says. It says that Jesus, speaking of Jesus, says he makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow. Wow. So that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. I love that. So that the whole body is healthy, number one, health. Not just growth in size, but growth on the inside. That the body is healthy. Healthy things grow. Did you know that? Things that are not healthy do not grow. I've got a tree in my backyard right now that I planted, and for a while, it was having a hard time because it was transplanted from the pot into the ground. And so it wasn't very healthy. It started to wither. It started to turn brown. Its limbs started to droop, and it started to sag. And we watered it every day, and we you know, had these crazy heat waves coming through and all that kind of stuff, and I was very concerned about this tree until I saw something happening. All of a sudden, I saw at the top of one of the branches, it started to sprout up, and it's starting to push through. Now... Why can it do that? Because it's starting to become healthy once again. Healthy things grow. This church will grow if we have healthy members sitting in those seats with healthy hearts. Plain and simple. So that's why we're constantly getting the word of God into you. That's why every day I'm on my knees before the Father praying for you is because I want to see you mature and grow. Why? Because when you get healthy and when you start to do your part, now all of a sudden, look what it says. It says the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Wow. 
That's really what this place ought to be all about, is being filled up, being mature and growing and expressing the love of Jesus. So what happens when we get together in unity? Greater effectiveness, greater growth. Third thing is this, is a greater witness. Jesus said they will know you if you have love for one another. If there is a unity and a love that takes place amongst the saints, then people will know that we are the disciples of Jesus. And in Jesus' high priestly prayer in John the 17th chapter, turn there with me, John chapter 17, take a look at verse number 21 with me. Jesus is praying to the Father, and in his prayer, he prays for you, and he prays for me. Now, that may be a new concept to some of you guys. You say, Jesus prayed for me? I didn't read my name in the Bible. No, you didn't, but take a look at what he says in John chapter 17, verse number 21, verse number 20, if you want to read that, I do not pray for these alone, but for those who will believe in me through their word. In other words, the apostles are going to preach the gospel, and people are going to believe that word. And down through the generations, that comes all the way down to our present day, and this is for you, and this is for me. Jesus prayed for us before he went to the cross. Verse 21, what does he pray? He says that they all may be one, that's unity. As you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. In other words, if we as the church can get it together, if we can unite and not separate over differences or offenses or stupidity or any other thing, If we can get it together, then as we are united and one, as Jesus was in the Father and the Father was in Jesus, now we are one where? In him. In other words, I know that I'm different. I know that you're different. But it doesn't matter because if we're both in him, then we are one together and the same. And now the world will know that Jesus was sent of the Father. We will have a greater witness You know why people bounce out of churches oftentimes? Like a rubber bouncy ball that somebody threw and they just hit church and then they bounce out. You know why? Most of the time it's because they walked in and they saw something. They saw an offense. They saw a division. They saw a schism. They saw something that that just, they, they didn't like it. You know, they, they, they heard something. They, they, they walked in with somebody and they said, oh yeah, come over here and sit with me. And I, don't sit with that guy. I don't really like that guy. Division. But see, when people walk into a church and we love one another and we say, hey, come over here, I want to introduce you to my friend, and they don't look like me, they don't act like me, they don't smell like me, now all of a sudden they say, well, wait a second, you're associating with that guy. When would you ever associate with that guy other than in church? See, it's unusual, it's peculiar to the world, and it catches their attention. They say, if you can love them, and they can love you, because I know you, brother, and you, you... But they still love you anyway, and even though they know you, and even though they smell you. Man, I need to get a hold of what they got at this place. See, it is a witness to a lost and dying world when we get it together. Can you say amen? Amen. So what will it take to achieve unity? See, if we know that there's greater effectiveness, greater growth, greater witness, then what's it going to take? Because it's not just going to happen by accident. How many of you know Jesus' prayers will be answered if we can work together together? with the grace of God in our lives, right? So what is it going to take for us to be the answer to his prayers? Here's what it's going to take. First thing is, is this, greater love. Greater love. Love covers the multitude of sins. There may be a history in our nation of division, and it may be things that are rightfully so. Listen, I don't blame people for having some of the attitudes they have, if I can say it to you like that without, you know, getting into it. Didn't know that I was going to go there tonight, but I guess we're going to have to go there. But I don't blame people for having some of the attitudes they have. I don't blame people for some of even the the prejudices that they have, okay? And, and, And I'm not saying who or what, okay? You can figure that out on your own. Because there are some crazy things that have gone on in our nation and that are going on in our nation. I understand why people are scared. I understand why people are confused. I understand why people are hurting. Because at times I feel scared, confused, and I'm hurting for our nation. It pains me to see what's going on. And yet, if we can operate in a greater love, then that unity principle will bind us together. Listen, if you've been offended in church... 
and you came to the rock because you were offended at some other place, can I tell you something? If you continue in that offense and you don't forgive and operate in love and put it under the blood of Jesus, you're going to get offended here and you're going to bounce out. Listen, this church gives it to you maximum strength. We're in your face and we tell you like it is. That's just what you're going to get when you come to the rock. And if you are operating in, fe- in offenses, it's time to lay those things down and say, I forgive and I choose to love. And I'm going to release that to the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, which he shed on the cross. And I'm going to choose to overlook that offense, even though I'm right, even though I'm just, even though God should smite them and turn them into a little charcoal briquette on my behalf. I'm going to lay down my right to that lightning bolt and I'm going to forgive and I'm going to love and I'm going to move on. Because the bitter root will take hold in your heart. And even though you know you should love them, and even though you can say, well, you know, I love them, I love them, but I just can't, I I just can't. But I love them. No, you don't. But if you can love and you can forgive, if you can release those things to Jesus. Listen, Jesus will slap us all around when we get to heaven and tell us all really how to straighten us all out. Because at that time, we will see him as he is, and we will be like him when we awaken in his likeness. I believe that there's going to be a lot of answered questions when we open our eyes in eternity and we stare into the face of Jesus for the first time, and when we realize, wow. And we won't be saying, yeah, I was right. All those suckers out there better listen to what I had to say. No, we're going to say, I was wrong. That's why Jesus is going to have to wipe every tear away from our eyes. It's because we're going to realize some things. We're going to wake up. And it's going to be different than we thought. My goodness, guys. We have to operate in a greater love. Ephesians chapter 4, turn there with me. In Ephesians chapter 4, great chapter talking about the unity of the body of Christ, talking about how we can get together, how each one of us has a part to play. But he starts out, and it's almost like these thoughts launch that conversation. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 1, he says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you. He's begging you. He's asking something of you. To walk worthy of your calling, with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another, how? In love. In In other words, I can't suffer long at the hands of my brother. I cannot bear with anyone. I cannot be patient and kind and gentle and meek if I'm not operating in love. If I don't allow the love of God to come into my heart and to flow in me and then through me to other people, it's just not going to work. I will give up without the power of the love of God. Love is the greatest power in the universe. Why? Because the Bible tells us that God is love. Therefore, when you're full of love, you're full of God. And when you're full of God, you're full of love. And so he says, I beseech you, I beg you, walk worthy of your calling. We say, yes, I'll do that, yes, amen. And then he says, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. Look at the next verse, verse number three. He says, endeavoring, that means working hard at doing this. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You know what that means? You know what that tells me when I read that verse? That shows me that it's going to be hard work. That shows me there's going to be things that grate against my flesh. People aren't going to do things the way that I think that they should do them. I'm going to come to church and find somebody sitting in my seat. Oh, no, they didn't. That's my seat. Who do they think they are? Well, we'll see. Bless God. I'm going to get here earlier next week. Then we'll see whose seat that is. Right? It's going to be people that take your armrest. They may not sit in your seat, but they'll sit next to you and they'll put their arm up. Don't they know the unspoken rules of the armrest? That if you're sitting there, you keep it to the side and you don't use that armrest because that's a shared rest. They can have the one on the other side where the empty seat is, but not this one. I don't get this one. And I'm not sharing it with them because we're not touching. That's just weird. That is a demilitarized, no-fly zone armrest. You cannot touch it. 
People are going to do things that you don't think they should do. Somebody's going to smile and greet you. They're going to be zealous and boisterous. They're going to tell you, this is the day that the Lord has made. God bless you, brother. And you'll have had a terrible, terrible day. And that's the last thing you want to hear when you walk into church. You want to hear, oh, I'm so sorry, brother. Let me just come over here and hug on you. Know? And they're saying, bless God. And you're saying, bless something right now. I'm going to get out of here because these guys are way too happy. They're way too nice. Who chose these greeters, right? Why do they got to have the happy greeters at the rock? People are going to do things the different than you would do them. You're not going to like the music. You're not going to like the way that we preach. You're not going to like the lightings. Why why do they have to have such a big screen? I mean, really? And yet, God is saying, endeavor, work hard at keeping the bond of love and peace in the Spirit. We have to work hard at it. It's going to take a greater love. See, without love, we will not be loyal. You know why I'm loyal to my wife? Because I love her. You know why I'm loyal to God? Because I love him. You know I'm loyal to you guys? Because I love you. See, love, if love is the motivating factor of your life, then you will be loyal to it. Why? Because there's love behind it. What you love, you're loyal to. If you love sports, man, you will be loyal. If you love a certain team, you'll be loyal to that team. But see, when you're not in love, if you, if you just got excited about it for a little while and it was cool and it was fun, that sort of thing, but you didn't love it, your heart wasn't in it, nah, eventually you'll depart. See, if we can love one another, we will be loyal to each other. If we can operate in the love of God and see each other with God's vision, when we see each other through the love of the cross, when you see someone, hey, that's somebody that Jesus died for. That's somebody that Jesus gave his life for. That is somebody that Jesus thinks is valuable enough to go through the suffering and the pain of the cross, and they are one of the people that is the joy that was set before him. He saw their face on the cross. See, that changes your perspective, doesn't it? And now all of a sudden, if you can love them with the love of the Lord, now you can be loyal to them. Listen, I may not like you, I may not agree with everything that you say, but guess what? I love you, and we're going to work this out together, brother. We're going to get through this together, sister. We're going to make this happen. Now, that doesn't mean you have to eat dinner with everybody that you don't like, that sort of a thing. There are certain things that's just wisdom, and you don't do it, okay? But it, at the very least, you can come and sit together and agree on the armrest. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Richard Baxter, after St. Augustine, said this, in essentials, unity in non-essentials, liberty, and in all things, charity or love. In essentials, unity. We can agree on the essentials of the word of God, can't we? We can agree about salvation through Jesus Christ. We can agree about the virgin birth. We can agree about these things. We can agree about the Bible. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, things that don't matter, right? Then liberty. Hey, if you want to wear your hair spiky like that, go ahead. Go on with your bad self, right? You, you, you like the, the, the jerry curl or whatever it is? Go for it. That's cool. See, in non-essentials, liberty. You know, some people like rap. Some people like rock. Some people like, you know, hey, as long as you're, you're staying with the things of God, as long as you're going forward with the things of God, then there's liberty in those things, style and all that kind of stuff. That's fine. But in all things, doesn't matter whether it's the essentials or the non-essentials, let everything that you do be motivated by love because when you're in love, you will be loyal, and when you're loyal, you're together. Can you say amen to that? And I'll throw this one into that, 1 Corinthians 13, 8a, love never fails. Amen? See, if you were having a problem, you said, I can't do it, Uh, I failed at it, love never fails. I tried to work it out. They didn't want to work it out. Love. I tried saying something. It it fell on deaf ears. Love. You don't have to say anything. Love. Say it with your love. Amen. Second thing is this. What's it going to take? Greater love. Second thing is this. Greater care. Greater care. Not just love, but care. Not just the agape love of God, which is powerful enough. That would be enough if we just did that. And that would motivate the next couple of things that we're going to talk about. But once you've got that love thing down, then you're going to cross over into something called care. I actually care enough to do something. I care enough to tell you the truth. I care enough to not separate. I care enough to stick together. I care enough to get involved. I care enough to be a part of that. I care enough to give. I care enough to serve. I care enough to speak. I care enough to pray. Whatever it is, we have to have a care that is motivated by love that expresses itself in our care. You're there in Ephesians, turn back to the book of Philippians, just uh, Galatians, Ephesians, then you'll find the book of Philippians right after that, chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2 through 4, the Apostle Paul is writing in the Philippian church, 
And he says to them, fulfill my joy by being like-minded. Having the same love, there's that love that we have for one another, being of one accord and of one mind. Right there he described unity, didn't he? He says, I want you guys to fulfill my joy, being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. In your thoughts and in your actions, there's unity. Verse 3, look at what he says. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. This is where your care is expressed. This is where you take the time to say, you know what? Not your needs at my expense, but rather my needs at your expense. See, in our modern day society, we don't like that. We've been told, hey, whatever you got to do to get yours, go get it, right? If you got to step on a couple people on your way up the ladder, go right ahead. Because you got to do you. You got to make sure that you take care of number one, right? And number one means myself. But see, if I'm operating in unity, I'm not looking out for myself. You know, any, any team sport will teach you that. If you're only looking out for you as number one, your team is going to fail. And you're going to get lost on the court or lost on the field or lost in the, the ice rink or whatever it is. Why? Because teams are what win games, not individuals. It's individuals working together with others. And the unity principle, when it comes into effect in our lives, if we can say, hey, listen, I'm not going to elevate myself, I'm going to elevate others, then now all of a sudden the unity principle comes and we are now more effective for the kingdom of God. So he says, in verse number three, he says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let's, let each of you esteem others better than himself. Verse four, let each of you look out not only for his own interests. So he says, don't do this at your own expense only, okay? You still need to work, you still need to eat, you still need to take care of yourself, but look at what he says, but also for the interests of others. In other words, as you're doing your part, as you're coming to church, as you're growing, some of you guys are in a place right now where you say, I've got to get myself. I've got to get in with God. I, I need God to do something in my life. And that's okay. But while you're taking care of that, whatever it is in your heart, while you're growing in the things of God and while you're coming up into the things that God has for you, then look over your shoulder at the person next to you. Look across the aisleway at somebody around you and say, I wonder what they're going through. I wonder if I could pray for them. Uh, I wonder if I could encourage somebody. Uh, I wonder, hey, that person sat by themselves. I wonder if they know anybody here in church. You know, I didn't grow until I had somebody come alongside me and teach me some things out of the word of God and start to befriend me and start to tell me, start to encourage me. Maybe you can be that for someone else in this place. Maybe you can be the one that walks across and befriends somebody and raises them up. Maybe you, you never got involved in ministry here because you never thought you had a purpose, but the moment you start getting involved and you start looking after other people, all of a sudden, your heart will get so full and you will find that breakthrough, you'll find that freedom that you were looking for, but never got on your own. Happens all the time. Sometimes people think, man, I, I just don't have a heart, I'm not on fire, I used to be passionate. And it isn't until they go and they start reaching out with our outreaches, or they start working in the children's ministry, or, or they start putting their hand to something here at church, and serving someone else, and not just serving themselves, that all of a sudden, that fire comes right, why? Because it's like a sacrifice on the altar, the fire comes out of heaven, and hits it. But we have to have a greater care. See, other people should leave your presence better than you found them. We used to have that principle when we would go into churches and do ministries and uh, when we would travel, we would go to campgrounds and things like that in order to leave a witness. We would, we would leave wherever we went better than we found it. See, our care keeps us from being selfish and isolating ourselves. How I many you know if a church group goes into a place and they leave it a mess, you're not getting invited back, right? In the same way, if you meet up with somebody as a Christian and you leave that a mess, you're not going to get invited back. The doors will be shut but if you leave people better than you found them. I, I know this is a kind of a weird concept to think about. How do I leave somebody better than I found them? Here's how you do it. You encourage them. You pray for them. You bless them. You honor them. You love them. There are people all around us that have not experienced any love whatsoever. People who were raised void of love. People who were disconnected. People who don't know what true love really feels like. Listen, guys, if we can get a greater love and a greater care and we can leave people better than we found them, if when people are excited about being with us, 
All of a sudden, it's going to change not only this church, not only this community, it's going to change the world because that kind of love will catch like wildfire and it will go around the planet because God trusts us and God can bless us in that. On the job, you should leave your boss better than you found him or better than he found you. At home, when you're going to work, you should leave your spouse and your children better than you found them in that morning. When you're going across your neighbor's path and you see them, you should leave them better than you found them. Just the other day, I had the privilege of saying hi to one of my neighbors. Uh, I live on a street and I have to drive up this driveway and they're not often out, you know, and, and we're kind of isolated from each other. We drive a long distance away and we're all there and most of the time when I'm leaving, I'm coming to church or something like that, so we were waving things like that. But I happened to be coming home one night and one of my neighbors was out in the front and I was able to stop and just say hello and he had come to one of our church services and he said, you're the preacher. Hey, you did a great job. And I was like, man, that just blessed me. Thank you for saying that. And then I was like, well, you know what? Thank you for being you. Thank you. And I told, man, your wife is doing just a bang-up job on them roses, boy. You tell her that I said I like the roses out front. Those look good. And he says, well, I ain't doing that. That's her thing, you know. And we started getting into the man discussion of what men do and women do and all that kind of stuff. We were chopping it up. Man, it felt good. It felt good. We were able to mutually encourage one another. And we left each other better than we found each other. You know, I was just driving home, just had the day on my mind, but I was blessed. And I don't know, he might have been going to get his mail or something like that. I don't even know. But man, when he walked away, he had a smile on his face. Leave people better than you found them. Amen? Amen. Proverbs twenty-seven seventeen: is iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. See, when people get around us, even if sparks fly, right, you still leave somebody better. I've had meetings that I've gone into, and the sparks have flown. It's been hot. It's been friction. It's been all that. But, man, when we walked out of that place, we walked out arm in arm together with vision and unity and purpose for the things of God. <laughs> last thing is this for tonight. What's it going to take? Not only greater love, greater care, but this is the last one for us is greater effort. We have to work at this, guys. This isn't going to happen just because you sat in a church service. This isn't going to happen because you listened to Pastor Dan preach this message. I, w I wish that was all that had to happen. Then I'd just play the CD for everybody and we'd all get it together. No, we have to work at this. This is something that we have to purpose in our hearts. I'm going to unite. I'm not going to divide. Offenses will come, guys. Offenses will come. I will probably say something stupid. Uh, the guy who doesn't forget anybody's name will forget your name at the back door, right? Something's going to happen where you're going to get offended by something that happens in this church that will forget something. Uh, we won't announce something. Uh, we won't do something that you thought we should do. You'll have a meeting with a pastor here, and you'll say, I've got a great idea for ministry, and nothing will happen. Okay, And you will have opportunity for offense. But if you work hard at this, then we will stay together. We will stay united rather than divide. It takes a greater effort on our parts. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 10. Great verse in the Bible. Turn there with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 10. Again, we see the apostle pleading, begging, begging for these things. You know when God starts repeating himself, we ought to pay attention. I ought to get more than one amen from the front row. When God starts repeating himself, we better start paying attention. Amen. He says, now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, and that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. He says, I'm begging you guys to get it together. I'm begging you guys to have a greater unity, not just people gathering at a church but people who actually talk the same talk. You know how the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks? It's one of the things about The Rock that I love is that you can go out there in the community and you can hear from people what they think about our church. Anytime I invite someone to church, they say, oh, I know that church. Oh, I know someone that goes to your church. Oh, I know. And you know what the people are saying about us? They're saying, you guys are radical. You guys are, are just, you know, expressive. You guys are reaching out. You guys have a heart. See, that's who we are, is, is, is what we express and what we speak so we need to all be speaking the same thing our language comes from the heart that we have because out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speak but it, it doesn't stop there just with what we say he says that we all speak the same thing that there be no divisions no schisms that is a rending like a piece of cloth that you tear and it's irreparable that there be no schisms no divisions among you he says i don't want you guys separated i want you guys woven together and he says that you be perfectly joined 
together. Now this word perfectly joined together in the original language is the same word that it uses for the disciples when they were mending their nets. You know what that means? That means they were woven together. You remember what Ecclesiastes said, a cord of three strands is not easily broken. That's us together with God wrapped in and through and around us. See, that cord cannot easily be broken. That cord is a strong cord. That cord is a cord that will hold us up in times of pressure and weight. He says that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. See, the effort in our words and our loyalty and our thinking and judgments, ultimately understanding of unity will be shown how in the decisions we make. Because when he says your judgments, that's going to be shown in your decisions. Now, if we cannot agree to anything else, we can agree to this one thing. This is the unifying factor of our lives. Jesus is the unifying factor of our lives. And if that wasn't enough, we've got his spirit, we've got his grace, we've got a great church, we've got a great life, we've got a great purpose. We can speak the word and in our understanding we can now do the word. And the closer we get to God, the closer we get to one another. Now I want to put an image up on the overhead screens for you back here. I'm going to put, we've got me, we've got you, and we've got God. Now notice the distance between me and you, right? Now we may be separated. How can we unite Is it just by working at coming closer together this way? Well, me and you, let's say we we don't agree on things, but we do agree on God. And so we're heading towards God. Let's put the arrows up there, guys. We're heading towards God. So here's me and you, and we're both headed upwards towards God. Now, I want you to notice something. The closer you get to God, let's get the next one, the closer we get to each other, right? You see that? So as our journey, as we travel towards God up that We start to get closer to each other. How? Through love, through care, and through our efforts. It starts with love, it goes to our care, and it ends in our efforts. I want you to just take a moment, just close your eyes, and let's just take a moment in the presence of God. What is God speaking to you? What did God say to your heart during this message? I want you to just answer that question in your heart right now. What is God speaking to you? Maybe tonight you realize there were some offenses that you need to deal with. Take a moment right now and confess those things to God and repent of them. Put them under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. What is God speaking to you? Maybe you're the person that's been bouncing from church to church and you're saying it's time for that to stop. I need to unite with church rather than divide from church. Maybe tonight you're getting planted. You're going to commit, God, I'm I'm not going to divide when offenses come. I'm going to come together maybe tonight God was speaking about operating in greater love greater care and you see some specific things that you need to do with greater effort just take a moment and commit those things to the Father say God I'm committed to love I'm committed to care I'm committed to do my part and work towards this God as it says in your word What is God speaking to you? If you would just take a moment, whatever God spoke to you tonight, just write that down. Commit it to paper or to your notes on your tablet or your phone. Because otherwise you're going to forget. You know how I know that? Because I forget stuff when I don't write it down. Write it down. Take a moment. If you're here with your spouse or you're here with a friend and you trust them to, to tell them that, lean over and whisper it in their ears. This, God just spoke to me. Go ahead, take, take a moment and whisper that in their ear right now. What's God speaking to you? Now can we just say thank you to the Lord for the word that he's spoken to our hearts. Can we give God a praise tonight? (laughs) Hallelujah. God is so good. Hey, I want to just take a moment. No one get up, no one leave during this time. Church is almost done. But I got one more thing I want to do and then we'll let you go. I want to make sure before you leave this place that your heart's right with God. Because if your heart's not right with God and you die, you're going to go to hell. I don't want that to happen to you. I know you don't want that to happen to you. But listen, most of all, God doesn't want that to happen to you. That's why I sent Jesus beaten, bloody, hung on a cross. So you didn't have to go to hell. He gives you the free will choice. He loves you so much. 
But he gives you the free will choice with your, choice with your life while you're here on the earth. Where you go, whether it's heaven or hell. Now, sometimes people get offended that pastors even talk about hell. They say, I don't believe in hell. That's not real. That's a story that people made up to scare their children into being good or to, you know, just be mean-spirited towards others. It's a fairy tale. But did you know that hell is spoken of all throughout the Bible, Old and New Testament? Jesus himself talked about hell. It's a very real place. There's only one or two places you're going to end up. It's either heaven or it's hell. That's what the Bible says. When it's all said and done, we are eternal beings made for eternity. And God says, I'm giving you the choice with your life while you're here on the earth where you go, whether heaven or whether hell. So then the question is, since I don't think anybody's saying, well, I want to go to hell, no one wants to go to a place of torment. No one wants that pain. No one wants that eternity. So because we know that, then how do we get to heaven? Sometimes people have the craziest ideas. They say things like, well, all roads lead to heaven. Really, do all roads lead to the moon? Well, we would say no. No, they don't. Then what makes us think that all roads lead to heaven? Sometimes people say, well, you just do your thing. I'll do my thing. The church is out there. There's so many churches. And the only way to understand that is that God's okay with everything. And so God's going to let everyone into heaven. All roads lead to heaven. But do you think that after God is so specific in the Bible about Jesus coming, about him suffering, about him dying on the cross, I think after he's so specific about how he sets up the church and how he sends the Holy Spirit, so specific about all the prophecies and all the things that took place all throughout the Bible, you think that after he's so specific about all that other stuff that now that Jesus got on the cross, he says, yeah, now whatever, I don't really care anymore. I, I did my part on all that other stuff. You just come on, whatever you want to do, whatever they want to do, whatever the churches out there do, that's cool. Everyone will make it, ollie, ollie, oxen free. Well, listen, the invitation is open. And God wants everyone to go to heaven and be with him. That's his desire. In fact, the Bible uses the term, that's his will. That's why God set it up the way that he did. And yet, just because God set it up that way doesn't override our decisions and our choices because God gave that to us as well. And God could have created thousands of robots to worship him, to bow down before him and to praise him, but he didn't want robots he wanted a free will agent, somebody who would love him, somebody who would want to be with him. And therefore, he says, you choose while you're here on the earth. So then how do we get to heaven? Well, sometimes people think, oh, if I just be good enough, or if I just do enough, if I get involved enough, if I help out enough. Maybe you've been in church your entire life. And you think that because you were involved in church growing up or because your parents took you to religious classes or hung a cross or a St. Christopher around your neck, had you baptized or christened as a child, that you get to go to heaven because you were raised in church. Sometimes people think that because they're not some other religion, that by default, God lumps into the category of being a Christian. Sometimes people think, well, if I just sing in the choir or maybe if I usher or help out at a church, that I get to go to heaven. And yet, did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say you can do enough good deeds to get into heaven? No one in the Bible will say, just sit in a church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. It doesn't work like that. That's like me saying, I really want to be a car. And so I dress up with a Honda emblem over my chest, and I sit in my garage, and I make honking noises and, and, and revving noises like an engine, and I call myself a car, I'm a car, I'm a car, I'm a car. No, just a crazy dude sitting in his garage, right? Can't just sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, and that makes you a Christian. Can't do enough good deeds, can't serve enough or get involved enough or help out enough or give enough money to get into heaven because the Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. No one is perfect except one. His name is Jesus. So how do we get to heaven? Well, Jesus said it like this. He said, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. Now, I know sometimes we hear that terminology. We say, ew, born again. I don't like that. I, I don't want to have any part of that. I saw that in a movie. I saw that in, in a book I read or a blog on the internet, you know, and I, I really don't like that terminology and I don't want to be labeled like that. And so, you know, I'll just pass. Well, listen, if you pass on that, then you're passing on the greatest opportunity of your life and you're passing up heaven and choosing with your actions to go to hell. You say, well, how did I do that? Because you made a choice and you went in that direction. And if you don't have any part of being born again, if you're not born again, you will not make it. It's plain and simple. You must be born again, Jesus said. It's not a suggestion. It's not a way. It is the way. Now, sometimes people say, well, if it's not what Hollywood and movies and television and books and the internet say, then what is it? Well, let's let the Bible define what being born again is, shall we? From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God 
all of your life. It's that simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you in the last book of the Bible, book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking to a church, just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. That's pretty gross, graphic words from the mouth of Jesus. But what's he saying? Lukewarm, what's that all about? Well, it's a little in, little out, little up, little down, little token prayer every now and again, and occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. You're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, I'm going to give you this opportunity to make a choice. Jesus said, if you confess me before man, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So it's your call. It's your choice. Here's the opportunity. I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three. And when I say three, I'm going to pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang! That's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, yes, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You might be thinking, whoa, 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 wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Yeah, you might be. But let's get over that, can we? Because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. A moment of possible embarrassment for an eternity in hell? Come on. And yet the devil thinks you're dumb and he's trying to talk you out of it. Your flesh is trying to hold you back with insecurity. Listen, push past all that tonight. And let's go on with God because you know God's speaking to your heart right now. Who should raise their hand in a moment if you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Tonight is your night, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this? Maybe you never stepped into a church service before in your life and this is all a little weird, this is all a little different, but you know that this is right and you can sense that right now in your heart and you're saying, yeah, I want to start this journey with God. I'd like to go to heaven. Hey, come on, if you've never done this before, you can get right with God tonight. Or finally, who should raise their hand? If you're lukewarm, you've been in church, but you've been playing games with God. Come on, time to stop messing with God and get right. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching by television, the foyer, down at the Love Rock Cafe. Come on, if you're online, wherever you're at, across the nation, around the world, get ready, get your hand up, and then right afterwards, you can minimize your video browser, click the button that says respond to God, or go to our homepage and find the tab that says how to know God, and someone will lead you in a prayer. I'm gonna count to three. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Get ready if you need to do this. Get ready to get your hands up. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me. There's one. There's two. There's three. Four. God bless you guys. There's four wise people already. Four wise people already on this side. Five, six, seven. Thank you. Eight, nine. Got you over there. Who else? Nine wise people already. Ten. Got two hands up. Praise God. I'll only count you once. Thank you. God bless you. You can put your hands down. Anybody else? We've got ten wise people already saying yes to Jesus in this safe and friendly place. Anybody else that you know God's tugging at your heartstrings right now? Listen, don't resist. Don't resist God. Don't resist the move of his spirit on your life right now. God is saying, will you join the family? Thank you. Got you over there. Number 11. Who else? Who else tonight? Need to give God all your heart. Need to give God all of your life. Anyone else? Got 11 wise people. Where are you at? Number 12. Waving. Oh, right there. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you so much. A dozen wise people. Anybody else? I just want to make sure before we leave this place, I want to give you this last call, last opportunity. Come on, this is your time. This is your moment. Anybody else? Anybody else? They're waving over on this side. Where are you at? Thank you. Got you over there. 13. Amen. Can we give the Lord a great big praise for 13 wise people? All right. All 13 of you, if you're number 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. It's not too late. Here's what I want you to do. Get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Once you get in the aisle and meet me up front, listen, if your children raise their hands, bring them. They're welcome during this time, and they will remember this. It's good for them to have this commitment in church. Wherever you're at across all the auditorium back in the family rooms, if you're watching my television in the foyer or down at the Love Rock Cafe, then come into the church service right now. Let's all stand and welcome them. If you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand, come on down. Come on down right now. Come on. This is your time. This is your moment.
They're coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. Come on, you can come too. This is your time. This is your moment. Anybody else if you need to come? Come on. They're still coming. Come on, you can come too. Okay, hold on. Time out, time out. Hold on, hold on. We got about half of the people that need to be up here right now. If you raised your hand, listen, this is not a game. This is reality. This is God speaking to you. God is asking, will you give him all of your heart and all of your life? And this, without this, is not all. I'm just going to tell you like it is. Remember I said this during the message. One of the things about the rock, we're just going to tell you the truth. If you got stuff in your teeth, we'll tell you, all right? We're going to let you know. And that's just who we are. We love you enough to tell you the truth and not water it down. This is without coming down and making that commitment isn't going to make it. Because if you can't serve God in a safe and friendly church service like this, what makes you think you can walk out those doors and be a witness for Jesus or live a Christian life or make it? Listen, guys, we've got to lay down our pride. We've got to lay down our way. And we've got to do it God's way and humble ourselves. And when we do, that's when now all of a sudden the word of God comes to play in our lives. Now all of a sudden, that's when we're born again. That's when God does the work in our hearts. You can't save yourself. You can't clean yourself up enough. You can't be smart enough, nice enough, pretty enough. You have to surrender to Jesus and let him do that work on the inside of you. So I'm going to ask if we would, let's sing that one more time. And as you hear Reverend Elijah sing that song one more time, I want you, if you raised your hand, or you should have raised your hand, but you're resisting the Spirit's draw right now. And you thought... You were off the hook. Listen, God has given you one more call and he's saying, will you come tonight? Will you come and lay it down? Will you come and lay down your life here at the altar? Will you come and will you come home? You've been gone for too long and you kind of tested it out tonight just to see if it, you're still okay with God. See if you had the same feeling. Listen, God's saying, come to the altar tonight. Will you come? Let's sing that. Come on, come on. Just make your way to the front right now. Come on down. Come on down. Come on, you can come too. This is your time. Come on. Come on down. All right. Thank God you guys came. Glad that you guys are here at the altar. I want to introduce you guys to a friend of mine right over here on my right, your left. This is Pastor Joel waving at you. Really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on. You know, sometimes you go to church, you wonder, are they weird? I'm about as weird as you're going to encounter today, okay? He's cool. He's going to do three things. He's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again. He's going to give you some free information, some free literature. Find out what to do next in your walk with God. And then he's going to introduce you to a program we have here called Spiritual Personal Trainers. These are people who are going to connect with you. Remember we talked about the unity principle. One, if they fall, if they have someone with them, can pick them up. Listen, this person called the spiritual personal trainer is someone to come alongside you and encourage you. And if you maybe stumble along the way, they'll help pick you up, help encourage you, help you, right? One, one can do some good stuff, but two, get a better reward for their labor. This is somebody who wants to come help you to skyrocket you in your growth and in your walk with God, okay? He'll describe how that works. It's easy. It's free, okay? It's not a sales pitch or anything like that, but you do need to do it, okay? So if you guys will make a left turn and follow Pastor Joel right this way. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise.